Hello and welcome back to the MACC's 2024 season. My name is David Brown. I'm an Associate Professor of Finance at the University of Arizona. And in this video, we're going to be talking about long-term savings. We're going to learn a few new Excel techniques, as well as really understand the power of compounding and how much starting to save early can really matter for whatever your future plans are, whether they're retirement, saving to buy a home, whatever it is for your situation. So let's get right into the model. All right, as we get into the model, we want to remember that when you open these files, you're going to have to enable content, right? This is enabling the macros. So I'm going to go ahead and click enable content here. And if you haven't unblocked the file, there's a quick guide on the second tab of how to unblock the macros. So you'll be able to do that. All right, so let's get into the model All right here. Like I said, we're looking at long term savings today. So let's go ahead and start out by inspecting what our parameters are. As you can see here, we have a savings horizon, in this case, 33 years. Our annual savings amount, in this case, we're gonna start saving at the beginning of the year. So when we save this $6,900, it can earn interest or returns for that whole first year. We're gonna select what asset type we're gonna invest in, either cash, bonds, or stocks. And then we're gonna talk about the return type, whether it's the real return, which means that inflation has been taken out of it, or if it's a nominal return, which means it includes inflation. Inflation has been a hot topic over the last couple of years, so we'll make sure we see kind of the results on either case and understand when to use a real return versus when to use a nominal return. Now, the reason we have different asset classes is different people have different risk appetites and are more comfortable investing you know, in risky stocks or less risky bonds, or really they just wanna hold cash and stuff underneath the mattress. All right, so we're gonna look at those different scenarios and we have our expected return table over here. So these expected returns are something I made up. Uh, they roughly reflect history within the United States, uh, but don't take these as necessarily the end all be all and estimated expected returns because these things change over time and vary from year to year. So in this case, we're gonna start looking at the nominal returns. So in this case, the nominal returns means it has inflation included in it. So if inflation is 5% in a given year, you expect the purchasing power of your money to basically decrease by 5%, meaning that what used to cost a dollar now costs a dollar and five cents. So if you've invested your money at a nominal return of 1%, so say you have it in just a basic checking account, your dollar grows to a dollar and one cent. In that case, that would be less than inflation. Inflation might be 5%, and even though inflation is built into that nominal return, that means you're actually losing money on a purchasing power basis because that $1.01 can now only buy something worth about 96 cents in the past. So that's going to be your difference between your nominal return and your real return. The real return is basically the return after you take into account inflation. So you can see in this case, our real return is minus 2% if you just hold your money in cash. That again is because your cash loses value over time due to inflation, which means the real return is actually negative. So while some may see it as safe to put your money under your mattress, in that case, it's actually losing purchasing power over time. So it's really not a very safe investment for a long-term strategy where you're trying to preserve your wealth and save for something like retirement. So you can see that when we go from cash down to bonds, we have a significant increase in returns to 4% nominal and 1% real. So in this case, you can see that the inflation would expect it be expected to be 3%. And here for stocks, you would have a nominal expected return of 9%, which includes a 3% inflation amount, and 6% on a real basis when you've taken out the inflation. So we're gonna use those returns, and it'll be, again, depending on what asset class you decide to invest in. And really the point of this exercise is for you to see how much different the returns are when we look at investing in stocks with higher expected returns versus bonds or cash which mu with much lower expected returns and how those differences compound over long savings horizons. So I'll keep coming back to that throughout the lesson, but for now, let's just jump into the Excel file. All right, so our first question here, just kind of warm up to get us going. What's our total savings over the horizon? All right, so what we're gonna do here is we're gonna save for 33 years at $6,900 a year. So all we're gonna do is multiply those two together. So in this case, we're gonna be saving $227,700 over those 33 years, right? 
if we earned zero return over the entire period, then that's what we'd end up with at the end. However, we want to earn a positive return, hopefully. Hopefully it's not negative like it would be for a real return in holding cash, but we're going to see those differences play out. Before we do that, we actually have to look up what returns we should use. So here, we're going to do exactly what I just said. We're going to look them up as we could in this table over here. So for example, if we're looking for the nominal return for our chosen asset class, so stocks, then we could go over to our table and find stocks here, and then we find our nominal return here, and we see that the intersection is 9%. So you'd be tempted to just type 9% in here. However, that's not a dynamic formula. Whenever we use Excel, we want to use dynamic formulas. That way, when the parameters change, the model's going to change as well. So in this case, we need a lookup function. And let's start with the classic, which is VLOOKUP. All right, VLOOKUP is a function that is going to be in almost all versions of Excel, So, uh, but it's not going to be the most recent version that I'll show you in just a second. So the way VLOOKUP works is the first thing you give it, the first argument is the lookup value. So in this case, we're going to look up stocks, and then you give it the table array. So in this case, the table we want to look in is has the the values we're looking for in this left column, and then the value we want to return somewhere else in the table. All right, so we have our table array set up, and now we got to tell it which column we want our answer back from. So very basically, what it's going to do, it's going to look for our lookup value stocks in this first column. It's going to find it in the bottom position, and then we need to tell it that you want back the result in column one, which would just be the word stocks again, or the result in column two, which would be that 9%. So in this case, we're going to put two for what we want returned. And then finally, we're going to put false, which means we want to do exact matching. Uh, if you put true, you could do approximate matching, but we're not going to get into that with VLOOKUP today. All right, so now we have our answer of 9%. Let's double check that our answers are working. They look good. If we reset the parameters, so now it's changed to cash is our answer. And we see that our 1% is still correct. So our dynamic formula is working. All right, our next step is to say, what is the real return for that chosen asset class? Now you could do a VLOOKUP again and just expand your table array and choose the third column. Instead, I'm gonna show you the XLOOKUP function. All right, it's the same idea, it just works slightly differently with the parameters. So the first thing is our lookup value, same as before, now we're looking at cash. And the next thing you cho choose is the lookup array. So where do we wanna look for that lookup value? In this case, cash bonds and stocks is where we wanna look. Now the last argument you give it is what you want back. So rather than specifying that we wanted the second column of the table array, we just select the column that we actually want our values from. So we select that, we want the real value without inflation, and we see we get our minus 2%. We can verify our answers and make sure we're on the right track. All right, now this last one is a little bit trickier because now we wanna find the expected return for the chosen asset class and return type. Notice in the first two, we told it which column to look at, but you don't always know which column you want. In this case, we want the real return, but if we change the parameters, now we want a nominal return. So because we want that flexibility, we're going to have to use a third matching technique. And this is going to be called the index match method. So the index function is going to return a, the position that you ask for within an array or within a table would be another way to say it. So in this case, if we want stock, the nominal stock return, we could see that that's going to be in the third row and in this first column. All right, so we need a way to tell it, get me the third row first column. And that's what the third, second and third arguments of the index function do. So first it tell, you tell it what array to look in. Then you tell it, all right, now I want the row number. Well, to get the row number, this is where I can use match, or in this case, I'm going to use X match, which is the more modern version of it. So I'm going to look for, I'm going to match on stocks, and I'm going to look in this first column. So the same way XLOOKUP looks up, XMATCH does as well. It's just not going to give you a return value. It just tells you where in this list it found the thing you're looking for. So in this case, the stocks is in the third position. So it'll tell it, tell the index function that look in the third row. Now, similarly, we have to figure out which column to use. So here, if we use XMATCH, now our lookup value is this nominal. And now where are we going to look it up? Well, in our column headers. So in the nominal versus real. And we can see it shows up in the first column. So that's going to give us our third row first column. 
and we get our value of 9%. And again, the, the reason we're doing this is that when we reset the parameters and we get a change to bonds with nominal or bonds with real, everything is updating even though our formula has not changed. So we're making our model very flexible by doing it this way. All right, so we've got our data in now. We know we want to deal with this 1% return per year. Now we're going to have to build a model out to figure out how our balance grows over time. So in this case, we have a 50-year savings horizon. The problem says that's the biggest horizon we're going to have to deal with. So we'll build that in down here as we go down and start building our model out. So let's do our years. We're going to start down here. We'll make it years. We'll eventually get it right. And now I'm just going to use the sequence function to build out the numbers 1 to 50. You can use whatever you want there. Uh, I showed a few examples in the previous videos, so go ahead and check those out if you're not familiar. Now, what else do we want to check or keep track of? The beginning balance, how much we add to our account, our contributions each year, the return we get, and I'm going to say in dollars, and then our ending balance. So that's what we're really interested in is how does our ending balance accumulate over time? So our beginning balance, we know, well, that starts at zero. We can hard code that in. Our additions, well, let's go ahead and build that out. Let's go ahead, our additions up here, 5,200. Lock that in. Now our return, well, we know it's 1% based on bonds and a real return. So the dollar return then is how much have we invested? Well, that's our beginning balance plus our additions. And then times that real return. All right, so we are in $52 in this case. And so what we end with is our beginning balance plus our additions and plus any return that we earn over the period. So let's lock that in. And now we have our ending balance and we can actually come up here and reference our model and we can see that we've got that fifth answer correct. All right, our last thing to do to build out this model is let's copy this down so it works all the way out to 50 years. So the first thing with any of these account tracking type models is you have to look at the beginning balance of one period to the ending balance of the previous period. So let's build that link. We can copy these three cells down. And now we want to copy this whole line all the way to the bottom. All right, so we go down, we copy that down. I'm just using some control C and control V to paste this around along with control shift arrow keys to, to navigate the spreadsheet. And now we see if we go to the bottom at 50 years, we've accumulated $338,000 over our time period. Now, how much did we contribute? Well, let's go double check that. If we come to our top, we've contributed $260,000. So we've certainly earned a good amount of return over that period, but not exactly what we could earn depending on what asset classes we're investing in. All right, so before we go forward though, let's actually answer the next question before we really start to understand the difference in these different asset classes. Uh, and that is to figure out what year does the ending balance exceed $50,000? So how quickly do our account, does our account grow? In this case, we see the answer is 10. And visually, we can come down here and we see, okay, in 10, yep, it's 54,000. We hadn't reached 50,000 yet in the prior year, so our answer is going to be 10. But again, how do we do that with our model? Well, here, the XLOOKUP function comes in handy again. And what we're looking for, and we don't need a comma there, we just need our $50,000 value. And now we want to tell it where to look for it. So 50,000, we're going to look for it in this ending balance column. And what we want back is the year. So let's come over here and select our year column to return. And you'll see that we get a hashtag in air. What that's telling us is that it can't find 50,000 in this list. And if we look through here, well, it doesn't exist, right? There's no $50,000 value there. There's 49,000 and change and then 54,000. So what we want to do instead is an approximate match. We want to find $50,000 or the next biggest item. So if we come back into our function, we see that the fifth argument, so we skipped one there with two commas, is the approximate match or the match mode. And we want to do one for the exact match or next larger item. And then we get our answer of 10. So one last check to make sure our model is working as we expect it. Uh, what's the cumulative dollar return over the savings horizon? Well, there we just need to add the sum of all of our returns up and make sure that that works. So we'll come back up, we'll verify our answers. We see that they're working. 
All right, so we checked our answers. We see that everything is working. Uh, let's go ahead and reset parameters to make sure everything's okay. We get a 38 number of years. Let's verify answers. And we actually see we're off now. So let's see if we can see what happened. In our case, we think we should have $4.8 million, where the answer should only be 1.56. So if we scroll down, we see that we're adding up too many returns. We should stop at period 38, but we have returns over the next 12 years. So we built our model here for a 50-year horizon, not to adapt to shorter horizons. So we do have to make a little bit of an adjustment. So let's go back up to our top cell. And we got to add our additions, but only do it when we're actually in that savings horizon. So let's go ahead and use an if statement here. So we're going to say if the year that we're in, in the model, is less than or equal to our savings horizon, lock that in with F4, so we have our dollar signs, then we're going to go ahead and have an addition. Otherwise, we're going to add zero. All right, let's copy that down and see if that works for us. OK, this is good. We're, we're no longer contributing after our horizon, but we are still earning a return, which is not really what we want. We want this to show as a zero. That way, our calculations can use the entire column. All right, so in that case, let's do the same thing with that if statement. So let's say if years less than or equal to our year here, then we're going to do our calculation. Otherwise, let's leave that at a zero. All right, if we copy that down, we see our early numbers don't change. The later numbers all become zero. And now we see that our answer matches. So this last section is going to look at what our account balance can do over time if we just compare real returns in cash versus bonds versus stock. And the reason we're looking at real returns is that's what we care about in the future when we're buying things. A real return takes inflation out, meaning it adjusts basically for present day dollars. So if we think about something we can buy for $10 at the grocery store, then we can think about those same $10 buying the same thing in the future as long as we're using those real returns. So in this case, they're going to be lower because they don't include that inflation amount. And so let's look at our real returns. And so now we're going to have to model out cash, bonds, and stocks, even though our problem in this case is asking for bonds with a real return. right? And again, if we flip this around, we get cash with nominal. But really, we want to be able to compare apples to apples. So that's why we're going to do cash and real returns, bonds and real returns, stocks and real returns. All right, so now to build the next part of our model, we want to remember that we've already got a model that works here. We just need to copy it and reuse it a few times. So here I'm going to create three copies of this model. That way we can build this once for cash, once for bonds, and once for stocks. All right. So to adapt it now, all we really have to do is update the return we're pulling from. So in this first case, we want to change the return here to the nominal return, sorry, the real return on cash. We make that update, double click to copy it down. We make a little more room here. So we can see more. And now we're going to do the same thing over here. All right, we have our 9%. Let's grab that and we're going to drag it over to our real return on bonds. And then finally, we're going to do the same thing here. Let's take our 9%. And let's drag that over to our real return on stocks. And now we should be able to copy both of those down and make sure our balance is looking OK. I'm going to also, let's just take some decimal points off of these so we can see everything that we're working with. All right, now we can see what happens over time and cash versus bonds versus stock as we accumulate balance up. I'm going to go ahead and get out of the way. All right, so now let's scroll down and see what happens across the three scenarios. All right, with cash, we're actually losing return each period because we're losing purchasing power. Bonds, we're getting a little bit of a return, and we're getting a much bigger return in stocks. So early on, you see the differences, you know, negative $100 versus $58 versus $348. However, by the end, the difference and the difference is so big we can't really see it here. So let's actually, again, make these a little smaller so we can see the differences. We can see now we're earning $47,000 in return 
versus 2,000 versus losing $3,000. So huge differences in the returns and correspondingly huge differences in our ending balances, 835,000 versus 269 versus 152. So now we can really see that when we answer the questions in our model. So let's jump back up here. And now we can answer the question, if we use real returns, how much more would you have at the end of your savings horizon investing in bonds versus cash? So what we need to do is just a simple subtraction. So let's get the ending return for bonds minus the ending return for cash. And notice the way I've set the model up here is we can always use the year 50 value because it's not changing once we stop saving. We don't need to use something like a VLOOKUP to look up the, the particular year that we're ending in. Right, so we get our answer of 116,000. Now we can do the same thing for stocks. So let's come down. We'll get that stock value. I'll get out of the way so you can see what I'm doing. We do that minus the bond value. And we get our check answers here and we can verify answers again and it looks like we're doing okay. All right, the last two things are what about our percentage return? So let's look at our percentage return if we invest in cash. So to get a percentage return, we can just take what we end with divided by what we started with. So we already calculated that number of 220,000 in this case, and then subtract one, All right? If we don't subtract one, we get a 69%, which means you have 69% of your original balance. So if you want to return, let's subtract one off and you see that you actually lost 31%, which is the same as retaining that 69% of your starting balance. So now similarly, let's do the same exercise with stocks. <clears throat> Go over and get that value, divide by our starting balance, minus one. And we see here with stocks, we had a 279% return. So again, we're, it's the investing in cash for the long run versus stocks for the long run is the difference between losing money on a purchasing power basis, how much your money can actually buy, versus earning substantial returns over the long term. And actually, if we play around with our parameters a little bit, here we get one with 50-year horizon. At a 50-year horizon, you're looking at the difference between a 516% return that gives you over $2 million for retirement versus a negative 38% return, which leaves you around three or $400,000 for retirement. Those are big differences in numbers, which shows you the value of investing in the stock market for the long term. Thank you very much for joining me for this installment of the MECC Challenges. I hope you learned a little bit about how long-term savings accumulate, the power of that compound interest, the fact that our savings are growing on itself year after year after year, and how important it can be to invest at higher expected returns in things like the stock market uh, versus safer bonds or cash that while safer in the short term can actually be riskier in the long term because of the low rates of return and the potential of inflation to eat away at the, the purchasing power of your money. Now, what we didn't model here is the actual riskiness to see how big the ups and downs can be in stocks, which can be substantial. And that's why it's important to typically stay the course when you're investing for the long horizon, not selling when the market crashes, because almost always that's followed by a nice rebound over some period of time. Thank you again for tuning in, and I hope you're enjoying the MECC challenges.